Thanks, Claire, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, so I'm going to be presenting with my colleague, Chris, who will take up some of the latest slides. Um, and we'll be talking about Christmas and the way forward in UK grocery. Um, so this is how we'll do things today. I'll start off with a run-through of what happened at Christmas. We'll look at the performance of the major retailers, the market share data that we have, just to give a sense of how uh, Christmas was for the sector. I'll then move on to our new UK forecasts. Um, many of you will be aware that we produce forecasts normally in the summer, and uh, last time it was just before the Brexit vote. Um, we'd assumed in those forecasts we'd be staying in the European Union. Uh, as a result, we've now had to go back and revisit those forecasts, uh, which we did just before Christmas, so I will run through those. Um, we'll then also look at um, what's going to shape the retail environment in the year ahead. So we'll look at some of the investment priorities and the key trends that we are seeing in the sector at the moment. And then we'll wrap up with the questions. So as Claire said, do keep some sending us questions while we're talking, and we will take as many as we can at the end of the presentation. So let's just uh, look back at what happened at Christmas. Um, the first point to note, I think, is really the, uh, the timing of Christmas quite, was quite influential in the results we've seen. Many retailers have reported results now, and in general, those results have been better than we saw last year. Um, but a key factor really was the way that Christmas was, um, the timing of Christmas over weekends. So many people had the opportunity to shop on Christmas Eve, and that gave more people the chance to shop in, in supermarkets rather than convenience stores. And I think that really helped the trade. Um, the other point to note also is the timing of Christmas periods. Um, so last year was a leap year. That meant that everything moved on by two days. And that had the effect that many more um, good trading days were included in that Christmas trading period. So often there was a benefit from that effect. We saw also um, a softening in deflation. I think um, most uh, retailers um, reported that prices were still negative across um, many uh, important products. Um, but if you look at the Canton numbers, it was a plus 0.2% um, read for inflation. So, um, so those price pressures that have been building since Sterling's devaluation back in the summer are beginning to feed through. And that had a slight um, inflationary effect on the numbers that we saw from retailers. Um, going into Christmas, we also had um, quite a good um, read from our Shopper Vista data on uh, Shopper Sentiment. People were feeling pretty positive about Christmas. Um, when we polled them, over half of shoppers said they were satisfied with the choice of products available to them at Christmas, so reflecting the hard work that's gone into developing Christmas ranges. Um, and yes, shoppers do expect price rises to come through, um, but it's important not to lose sight of the fact that actually at the moment uh, the economy is still in quite a good place. You know, employment is high, there's been lots of wage growth through last year, um, and for many areas there was still deflation on the things that people were spending money on, so that really helped their budgets out the Christmas period. We saw also that uh, the multiples benefited from um, some good numbers at Christmas, and that really reflecting the hard work that they put into uh, improving their proposition through 2016. A lot of work going into making stores easier to shop, improving the ranges, investing in price, and all of that really um, worked in their favor at Christmas. Um, we saw that the discounters had um, <coughs> Once again, top of the growth rates, but, um, but in many ways their growth is, has been slowing on how it was, say, a year or two years ago. Um, so still a strong result for them, but very much driven by new store growth. Um, that said, we saw a lot of investment in festive ranges from the discounters, and that helped them to claim a greater share of the seasonal spend at a time when the multiples present stronger competition to them with their extended ranges. Um, and the last point really is that we saw some good numbers from the convenience sector. Obviously, there's um, not so much in the way of data around on the convenience sector, um, but um, the retailers that did report um, produced some pretty good numbers, um, reflecting range investments in their fresh offer and uh, more effective promotions as well. So just turning to some of the individual retailers here, um, Looking at the numbers here, um, you can see that of the, the food-focused retailers, and um, B&M actually was our top-scoring retailer with growth, like-for-like -like growth of over 7%. Um, that number really reflecting uh, some very um, good investment in their seasonal ranges, um, and also a soft comparative, I think, from last year when they were impacted by uh, teething problems at their new distribution centers. 
Um, the discounters, uh, food discounters, as I said, doing well there with Aldi on 15% and Needle on 10%. Um, of the major retailers, I suppose a co-op comes out top with growth of 3.5%, um, but worth noting that they're um, looking at just a three-week trading period over Christmas. Um, but their result really reflecting the work that they've done improving availability and working hard on um, a private label and on their fresh offer as well. Um, for Morrisons, um, the strongest performer of the big four, they had their best result for seven years, and that growth rate there of 2.9%, um, a step up on the previous quarter, and was against a positive comparative, unlike some of their competitors. So feeding into that, good performances from their best range, from the nutmeg clothing offer, uh, from improved store standards, um, um, and a new ordering system as well, which helped feed through to better availability. For Tesco, a good number, 0.7%, um, 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 and that was against a, a more challenging comparative from last year. So that was the eighth consecutive quarter of growth for Tesco and their third good Christmas. Um, feeding into that, good volume-led recovery, um, slightly less in the way of deflation, and investments also in availability and in uh, the quality of the food offer. For Sainsbury's, um, growth pretty flat there. Um, um, but up on a negative um, Q2 and a negative number from a year ago. Um, and they reported volume growth across all channels. And of course, Sainsbury's now includes the Argos business. And Argos, there was very good growth, around 4% on a like for like basis. And then just looking at the premium retailers, we've got Waitrose on 2.8%, um, a good number from them, um, but a significant amount of vouchering, I think, driving that top line number. And Waitrose is also benefiting from two extra trading days. So if you take that out of the picture, like for likes at Waitrose were more or less flat. Um, other premium retailers also did well, um, particularly Booz and M&S. The one retailer we don't have much information about at the moment is Asda. Asda reports its full year and uh, fourth quarter results at the end of February. So just picking up on some of the themes that we've seen at Christmas, <clears throat> Um, the first one really looking at quality, um, quality definitely um, was a, a big factor for retailers this year and lots of new investments in own brand ranges have helped to provide the products that people um, bought at Christmas. Um, so Morrison's for instance launching its best range in the back in the summer and um, that was uh, really well timed to um, provide those extra um, uh, premium products that uh, shoppers wanted at Christmas filling an obvious gap in their um, product offer and enabling Morrison's to compete better against the discounters. For Tesco, um, lots of investment through the year in things like the, the finest wine range, which saw sales grow by around 20%. Free From, also a focus as well, and that uh, was rewarded with a good sales uplift too. For m and um, around 300 festive lines were launched for Christmas, making m and a destination uh, for Christmas shoppers. That really fitting into m and commitment to renew a quarter of its range every year. Um, <clears throat> at Waitrose, we saw the launch of the Waitrose One range back in April, and that um, allowed Waitrose to basically consolidate all its premium tiers into a single range, allowing more effective support, um, which helped to drive the sales. So Waitrose One enjoyed a 21% uplift in sales. Um, um, and that provided that extra range that, uh, for Christmas. At Sainsbury's, 25% um, of products were new and improved over the last two years. Um, Sainsbury's, unusually among retailers, having a customer base who are naturally inclined to trade up if they have the option to do that. So that really played into um, Sainsbury's, played to Sainsbury's advantage for the Christmas period. And then at Co-op, we had um, an own brand renewal through the year, and that really um, helped deliver better results for them with uh, shoppers now incentivized by a 5% uh, discount through the new membership scheme that was launched back in the summer. Um, and lastly, the discounters, um, specially selected at Aldi, up 27%, um, following a big investment in that range with new products, uh, allowing it to compete better against premium retailers. Um, Turning to um, the fresh offer, um, this was an important factor at Christmas. Um, re more retailers than ever recognizing the power of um, fresh products to drive footfall into stores <laughs> at Christmas. 
So we saw a battle on value with more retailers looking at um, low-priced um, essential fruit and veg. Um, Asda, for instance, cutting its prices to 20p for popular vegetable lines. I'll be responding with a 19p uh, promotion. Um, but it was also a chance to promote things like the, the wonky veg ranges. So um, for Morrison's, for instance, uh, it gave away wonky carrots at many of its stores um, for, uh, for children to give to Rudolph the reindeer, um, which was a great, great PR and a good way to get family customers into the store. Morrison's also interestingly working with a trial on local sourcing. So in some of its stores, it's sourced produce from named farms in the local area, helping to provide that connection of provenance and engagement with the, the local area. And at Tesco, we saw um, a good outperformance in fresh, help really by the farm brands that were launched at the beginning of the year, and Tesco claiming market outperformance in fresh produce. And lastly, convenience, we saw some good numbers from NYSA, uh, which uh, <coughs> produced an 18% rise in fresh sales off the back of its Fresh 5 promotion. So just underlining the importance of uh, investing in that fresh offer to, to encourage more people to use convenience stores regularly. In the online sector, we saw um, uh, that it's been used more widely than ever, um, with some growth rates though, maybe a little bit down than what we saw a year ago. Um, reflecting the maturity of the sector and perhaps less focus by players in the sector on acquiring new customers and more focus on uh, um, earning the loyalty of existing customers. So of the retailers that have reported online numbers, um, Sainsbury's was in the best position with a 9% growth. Um, that sales, so that was a step up on, on previous quarters and also um, reflecting faster growth in orders and as I said, probably a bit less aggressive on marketing um, as it's focused more on those core customers. Um, and at the same time helped by improvements it's made to the website experience, by rolling out its mobile app, and by introducing Click and Collect to some 200 stores. Sainsbury's also helped by Argos, um, which was uh, achieved some very good like-for-like -like figures. Um, half of Argos stores are made online and collected in store. And there's lots of opportunity really for the Sainsbury's to grow Argos further, I think, by bringing more Argos stores into supermarkets and by making two clothing available through the Argos network. At Tesco, we saw more of a focus on basket building and less on customer acquisition, um, that really sort of enabling uh, online to become a more profitable channel. And this was also the first Christmas for, um, for retailers like Aldi Wine Online and also for Amazon. So we don't have data for them, um, but it just sort of shows that um, all of these retail, all these sales growth that was achieved by the multiples was um, up against new competition uh, from those retailers. Um, Christmas was also a time of some interesting uh, marketing tactics um, that helped to, to drive sales. Um, an interesting example was uh, Lidl, which has always been very active on social media, and this year launched its social price drop campaign, which encouraged shoppers to tweet about new products in order to lower their price in the run-up to Christmas. So, for instance, a new product was launched on a Monday. Um, shoppers could tweet about it over the next two days, and depending on how many tweets it received, that determined the price that it would be sold at on the following Saturday. Um, so this was used for things like lobster and serrano ham, Christmas puddings, uh, and, and the effect for lobsters, for instance, was to reduce the price to just £2.99, and 200,000 lobsters were sold following this campaign. Waitrose also um, innovated with this uh, daily um, campaign that ran through um, the days running up to Christmas with one-day-only promotions on things like champagne and Christmas crackers, helping to drive footfall through that period. And at Booth's, we also saw an interesting offer with a special meal deal, um, um, effectively for uh, Christmas dinner for eight people, priced at £100. So it provided everything that shoppers would need for that deal, and uh, it was a sellout. Um, beers, wines, and spirits are always a popular um, category at Christmas, and there was lots of uh, new ideas driving sales here. Um, um, alcohol was particularly important to booze success with um, growth of around 30% in lines like uh, champagne, craft ales and artisan gin. Majestic wine facing more competition from the likes of Aldi and also uh, from the stronger performance from the multiples um, uh, kept uh, tight control on prices uh, and that impacted its margin um, 
but nevertheless it's uh, achieved very strong growth this Christmas and is on track to be a 500 million pound business uh, by 2019. For Aldi, it was their first Christmas of the uh, online wine website that they have, and they sold over 13 million bottles of wine in December. Um, good results from Champagne and Prosecco as well, and we know that Aldi now achieves a 70 pound average online spend from its wine website. Um, and lastly, Morrison's. Morrison's, um, a year ago, um, uh, used spirits especially to, to drive its sales at Christmas, and um, and BWS was again a very strong category for the retailer um, this year, helping to, to lift that uh, like for like for the best performance for seven years. Um, worth mentioning also clothing, um, another driver of Christmas sales, a lot of investment through the year going into um, the clothing offer. Um, Grocer's clothing generally performing pretty strongly um, when compared to say the likes of Next. Um, um, and perhaps also benefiting from the closure of BHS during the year. Uh, for Tesco, um, Florence F and F likes and likes were up over four percent, helped by its uh, seasonal ranges, um, and that helped to offset a sort of negative uh, number for general merchandise overall. Um, that really reflecting the uh, the non-running of the club card boost promotion, which in previous years had really driven general merchandise at Christmas. Um, at Sainsbury's, um, growth around 10%, a very strong number from them, and as I said, lots of opportunity to grow that further by building to online and also by distributing clothes through Argos. Um, Morrison's also hoping to grow, it's looking, well, achieved good growth from its clothing business uh, through Nutmeg, um, helped by an expanded range, um, so not just focusing on kids' wear but moving more into adults' clothing as well. So putting it all together, um, these are the market share figures that we have from Kantar that came out at the beginning of the year. So it really confirms the story we've seen from those trading numbers from the retailers. Um, the one retailer we haven't really touched on so far is Iceland, which achieved growth of nearly 10%. Um, a really impressive result. And that a very consistent result over previous months. Um, reflecting a lot of work that's been done at Iceland to um, to compete better against the discounters, really. So investing in premium ranges, um, improving the quality of stores, introducing new branding, um, and introducing fresh and convenience ranges as well. And one of the stores that does that really well is the, is Clapham, which has just been relaunched at the end of last year. Uh, and for those of you with access to retail analysis, you can see our store visit there that shows the look of the new store. The other retailer we don't have results for is Asda, um, so you can see there sort of minus two and a half percent from Asda, from Kantar. Um, so obviously they're the worst of those retailers, um, but um, that compares to a figure of minus 4.7 in the previous 12-week period. So putting those numbers together suggests a significant improvement in Asda's trading. I mean, we'll wait with interest to see how the numbers uh, work out when Asda reports next month. Um, a good time, I think, to mention the uh, trade briefings and events that we have coming up over the next few months. Um, in, in a couple of weeks' time, February the 8th, we will be in Harrogate for the ASDA trade briefing, um, for the first trade briefing of the year. Um, that will be led by ASDA's new chief executive, Sean Clark, um, supported by uh, Rob Burnley, the operations director, who recently joined from Sainsbury's. Um, and then we've also got familiar faces like Andrew Moore and Andrew Murray, and also Alex Russo presenting on stage. That's followed in March by our Booze Trade, Booze Trade Briefing in Manchester, um, led by Chief Executive Chris D, uh, with uh, Nigel Murray, Commercial Director, and Julie Mills, Marketing Director, also on stage. Then in May, we have the Tesco Business Update, with um, uh, Dave Lewis confirmed as a lead presenter, along with um, Jason Tarry, the Chief Product Officer. Um, and then in June, we have the Sainsbury's Trade Briefing in London. So, so lots of events there, and, um, and do contact us if you would like more, int more information about them. Um, turning now to uh, the um, shopper situation, we have data here from our latest Shopper Vista research, which uh, gives an idea of how um, shopper sentiment is changing. Um, so looking over the five years, you can see that there's been a gradual improvement in the number of people who expect to feel better off over the next year, um, shown by the green bar at the top. Um, and there's been a decline also in the number of people saying they're expecting to be worse off. 
Um, but interesting that most people, or the, about half of people, are actually in the middle there, so not expecting a great change in their personal circumstances. And that really hasn't changed since the, the vote back in the summer. So a lot of uncertainty uh, really feeding through into people not expecting um, a great change in how their <coughs> circumstances will change. Um, but one area shoppers are changing is in their uh, ex expectations for price. Um, so this um, chart shows food price expectations over the next 12 months. And there's been a dramatic change uh, uh, since over the last year, and especially since the vote in the summer. Um, and uh, um, you can see now three quarters of shoppers are expecting prices to rise over the next 12 months. Uh, very few expecting any kind of price drops or, or just to stay the same. Um, so a real change in what shoppers are expecting. Um, but this hasn't really affected um, shopper priorities. So in this chart, you can see um, the number of people expecting um, to, say, to, to focus more on saving money in the year ahead has declined slightly, as has the number of people expecting to focus more on quality. Um, and again, it's the people in the middle and not really expecting any change who are in, in the majority. Um, so this takes us on to our forecasting, uh, our new forecasts. Um, as I said, we, we did the original forecast back in the summer, but we have now revisited these. And uh, just to remind you on how we uh, do our forecasts, um, we have sort of four key factors that feed into our, our numbers. Um, we start off looking at um, real household disposable income per person and to give us a sense of how much money that person has to spend on, on everything. Um, and we then look at uh, how much households spend typically on grocery. And that proportion has been in long-term decline. Um, so that gives us a sort of real position of each of the shoppers. And then we then add on to that the amount of inflation that we're expecting over the next five years and also the population growth as well to, to create those projections for um, market size. Um, and these are our new forecasts. So, <clears throat> Um, what we have here are sort of low, medium, and high scenarios, um, which uh, we don't, um, when we assume each of them are equally likely, I think given the, the way the negotiations are likely to go, it's impossible to, to judge where we will be in future. So all we can do is give guidance on where the market might grow to if certain things happen. So we've produced a number of narratives which are supported by um, changes in those metrics that I've just talked about. And these are the different scenarios that we get over the next five years. So just starting off with the, the mid-case scenario, um, and I should point out also that these numbers also use official figures from um, the Office of Budget Responsibility. Um, so in the mid-case scenario, um, we've got uh, Brexit occurring in early, 19, early 2019, with Article 50 triggered as expected by the end of March. And in this situation, we're expecting a sort of fairly um, um, balanced um, outcome. Um, so uh, some negotiations leading to a fairly quick conclusion. Um, there's loose monetary mon policy maintained. We get a recovery in commodity prices. Um, the, the interest rates are kept low, uh, but the economy continues to struggle. Um, so taxes are also kept low. So in this situation, we'd expect um, food deflation to be quickly reversed and price rises to come into effect. Um, shoppers will clearly become more price sensitive, particularly those on, on low incomes and with big debts. Um, and the volume growth that we've seen in grocery could well be eroded. There could be some switching to domestically produced products. Um, and overall, that produces a, an outcome where we'd expect 18% growth in the value of the market over the next five years. In the low-case scenario, um, the UK doesn't get um, the best outcome in the negotiations we're expecting. So few concessions offered by our European Union partners. We would leave the EU without a trade deal. So there'd be tariffs imposed by both sides. Um, we'd pull out of the common agricultural policy and interest rates would rise. Um, we could also see the national living wage perhaps being abandoned as it's seen as limiting labor market flexibility. So in that position, you'd have um, a position of weak demand, um, low wage growth, and inflation. And shopper confidence would also be low. Shoppers will make cut cutbacks in their weekly grocery spending. 
um, and volume growth would be impacted by much slower population growth as a result of new controls and immigration. Uh, so in that scenario, we've got growth of around 6%. Um, the most optimistic scenario we've got is the 30% growth, and that would come from um, more goodwill on both sides, from the UK and the EU. Um, the UK also retaining access to the single market after agreeing to free labour movement. Um, and the UK government using better than expected circumstances to, uh, to restructure the economy, wages would rise, and, um, um, and investors would also invest more, recovering their appetite for risk. Um, so in that situation, growth of 30%, so um, considerable differences between those scenarios. Um, and this is uh, the mid-case scenario, just comparing how we now expect it to be um, with our forecasts um, previously. So you can see in all cases that the, um, the growth is significantly higher than it was before. So previously we were looking at sort of half percent recovering to 2% with very low inflation in there. Um, now we've got more inflation, uh, less volume growth. Um, so we have a spike of growth around 4% in 2018 um, and gradually sort of falling back to around 3.5%. And just putting a bit more colour on that, you can see how that uh, five-year growth rate breaks down. Um, so we're now expecting um, most of the growth to come from inflation, um, about five billion pounds coming from population growth, uh, and consumption to be slightly negative uh, as inflation really erodes um, volume growth. And these are the two forecasts compared. So on the left, the old forecast. Previously, we were expecting quite a lot of trading up to come from a relatively positive um, economic outlook, more people feeling more confident, buying more volume. Um, in the new forecast, that comes out as um, slightly negative for tra trading up, um, and obviously a big change there in the amount of inflation. So that accounted for the vast majority of growth over the next five years. So at this point, it could be a good time to go to our audience poll. Um, and I'd be interested to know uh, from you um, what the impact has been on your business of, the, of Brexit to date. Um, so on the screen here, we've got three options. Um, so if, it's had no, if there's been no impact so far from uncertainty related to Brexit, then can you press A on your, on your keyboards? Um, if you have, um, um, you have delayed planned investments because of Brexit, then press B. And if you are, um, have reduced or cancel planned investments, then press C. So we'll just uh, um, keep the lines open for a moment. And I can see the results coming in right now. And uh, I think that's, uh, I think we have some interesting results here. Just keep it open for a few moments longer. I can see people are still voting. And um, that's good. Okay, so, um, <laughs> What have we got there? We've got 47% of people saying no impact so far, and then the results split evenly between delaying planned investments or, or cancelling them, so 27% for, for both of those. Um, so uh, interesting, that's the position now, and I wonder what will be the outcome in a year ahead. Okay, um, um, I'm now going to hand it to Chris, who will take you through the next section. Thank you, Nick, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, again today. So in my section, just going to spend about 10, 15 minutes just covering you know, when, when we look across the industry at the beginning of the year, where do we see retailers really focusing their attention? I guess the overarching thing they're doing is it's the kind of the never-ending and constant attempt to align with evolving consumption and shopping habits. And before we start to get into what those shopping habits look like. Um, just wanted to take a moment to really drill down on kind of the importance of habits because it's something that we've been talking about, it's the wrong way Chris, uh, something that we've been talking about more and more in the office and it was triggered by, so at our flagship event last year, the big debate, we had a behavioral scientist called Dr. Dimitris Sivrikos come on stage from University College London and he spoke really compellingly about this concept of loyalty and I took it really seriously partly because he was wearing silver shoes and a turtleneck on a Tuesday, and I think you have to take that seriously. But also, I think this idea, so what he was talking about was the importance of habits versus preference. And what he spoke about was that 
it's kind of integral to the human condition. So we are generally quite whimsical when it comes to making preferences. If we choose a, a favorite pair of shoes or a favorite product, quite often that moment will be defined or that decision will be heavily influenced by what's going on around us at the time. And so that decision can change and a couple of weeks later or just a day or two later, we have no idea why we made that decision or why we had that preference in the first place. Habits, on the other hand, are much more enduring. They're much more long-lasting, again, because we're human. Habits appeal to us because they're reassuring. They save us time. They save us effort. And for me, this really resonated. And I started to think back. I became a dad for the first time about 15 months ago. And I remember this is an anecdote that I tell quite often around this because I think it brings it to life quite nicely. Um, so at the time, we were looking to pick a buggy for our daughter, and we went through about three or four different buggies that we wondered which one we wanted to get. And we picked one in the end, and we loved the color. It was blue. It was fabulous. And about a month later, we got it, and I say we in inverted commas. Someone in my household decided that we no longer liked the color blue. We wanted the black one. So we built this really strong preference for the black buggy. But during that time, we were building habits as parents. So it turned out that we actually we were spending a lot more time in the car. We needed the buggy to be in the car. And then one, the one that we had was fine, but it was a bit big. Also, we were flying around. We wanted to go on holiday, and we wanted to take a buggy on the plane. Now, where I'm going with this is that after about six months, six to nine months, we realized that actually we needed an entirely different buggy. And we found a buggy that was perfectly tailored to the habits that we'd created and that we'd naturally come to as parents. That buggy was much easier to fold up. And so we bought it. And it just so happens that the buggy's red. And I hate the color, but it doesn't matter anymore because our ongoing relationship with that buggy is built out of the habits that it, that it caters to rather than a preference built out of a color. So this idea of habitual loyalty for me is going to get more and more important, particularly when we look across the marketplace at kind of emerging grocery trends, particularly devices such as Amazon Dash Buttons or the Amazon Echo or new business models such as Dollar Shave Club. For those of you who aren't aware of Dollar Shave Club, it's a bit like Cornerstone in the UK. It's a subscription model where you can get shaving products through the post. And these are really interesting. And I see a lot of people kind of getting hung up on dash buttons and whether they're attractive or not. And I think that's kind of by the by. What, what I'd encourage you to focus on is kind of the, the potential with it and what future iterations may well be able to do and ultimately what the Echo is able to do. And what they really do is the, the reasons why people need to leave their homes to go and buy products are rapidly starting to, to lessen. So with these devices, you know, shoppers can automatically reorder or um, with very little effort reorder products. And there's actually very little preference within that. So with a dash button here, you might pick the Andrex dash button because at the beginning you had a preference for the Andrex brand. But what keeps you tied in is the convenience of having the button in your house. Likewise with the Echo, what we're seeing is that the Echo software is designed to learn from our behavior, learn from our previous decision making, and actually make more intelligent decisions on your behalf. So as we see that technology start to move into being able to do grocery shopping straight through your Amazon Echo, you'll be able to say, Alexa, which is the name of the operating system, order me dishwasher tablets. You won't actually need to specify the brand anymore. Alexa will order you the dishwasher tablets that you've ordered previously. And then for me, what's really fascinating with Dollar Shave Club is that Dollar Shave Club entered into a marketplace where Gillette through Procter & Gamble were really dominating the in-store shaving scene. Dollar Shave Club launched with unbranded products and now holds more than 50% or I think 60% of market share online. What's fascinating with that is that these are unbranded products. So actually, consumer loyalty to Dollar Shave Club has been built more through the service and the convenience of the service than the products themselves. So little surprise that uh, Unilever bought Dollar Shave Club a few months ago. And then in terms of what those shopping habits look like today, so what we need to be tapping into, what we need to be catering to, it's this idea of shopping little and often, which will be of no, kind of new news to no one on the call. But last month, 48% of shoppers were telling us that shopping little and often is now their preferred means of doing their grocery shopping. That's a massive shift from what we used to see, where it used to be very much dominated by 
big basket shopping, maybe going out in the store for a couple of hours once, twice a week. And crucially, that's happening across multiple channels. Now, when I'm talking about channels, we talk about things like supermarkets, hypermarkets, discounters, convenience stores. On average, we are visiting 4.6 channels per month. Uh, and what I find fascinating about that was when I joined this company about a year and a half ago, I thought that was ludicrous. I thought, oh, crikey, I can't imagine anything worse. But actually, when you think about it, I look at my own shopping behavior, and I definitely visit five channels every month. And moreover, shoppers tell us that they enjoy doing it. And it's actually really useful because those two behaviors deliver against what I would describe as three key shopper truths. The first of which is value. Now, value is clearly, price is absolutely crucial to that, but moreover, quality is really important. One of the defining differences that discounters have made over the past five to eight years is to reestablish consumers' opinion of what value represents and what you can get for low prices. You know, discounters today are equally known for their quality goods as they are for their low prices. And that's what some of the big four have been trying to get their heads around and increase their competitiveness around. Value is also about um, being able to shop for what you need when you need it, not needing to worry about wastage, and actually being able to go to different stores and take advantage of different offers. And that also ties into convenience. So we've got to a point today where a few years ago, so a couple of decades ago, shopping was more around location. It was about where the store was, and you were somewhat bound by where your nearest store was and where you were willing or able to travel to. Shopping today has become about when. It's no longer about physical location. It's about being able to shop wherever I want to, whether it be at a corner store or a discounter that's now doing fresh much better, much more consistently, or increasingly through my mobile phone. And um, for those of you who kind of follow our, our market growth our market growth forecasts, we're forecasting that online is going to grow by about 63% over the next five years. And that also ties into personalization, or the, I also like to call it self-curation. For years through media, whether that be through Sky Plus or Netflix, we've been able to tailor our choices, pick and choose those uh, kind of pieces of media that, most, that are most relevant to us in a specific moment. We're now able to do that with our shopping. We're able to go and buy from a huge portfolio of different products from a number of different retailers and pick and choose those retailers that kind of meet our needs most relevantly in any given moment. And this is fundamentally, when we look at the year ahead, what we see the retail end industry looking to um, respond to, whether that be kind of established players such as Sainsbury's or Asda, and come on to a couple of examples from Sainsbury's in the moment, or really kind of innovative disruptors such as Deliveroo or Grays. And all of you will be well, well aware of Grays, but what you might not know is that you can actually, the combinations that you can pick for a Grays box are more than 200 million different combinations. So delivering to kind of total ease of use and total personalization. And so one of the fundamental things around uh, convenience is this idea of fulfilling any time, anywhere purchasing demands. So kind of omni-channel shopping. And this is be being done in different ways, and we'll see this accelerate in the year ahead, whether that be Sainsbury's in urban areas continuing to roll out their Chop Chop service, where you can order up to 20 items and get them delivered within 60 minutes of placing that order. Or the likes of Tesco outside of urban areas, really interestingly, launching their same day click and collect just a couple of months after Amazon Fresh launched. What we're seeing retailers doing is increasingly using their existing store footprint almost as forward operating um, distribution centers, which makes uh, delivering that omnichannel experience of fulfilling online orders more convenient and more cost effective than ever before. And what we're starting to see abroad, and we wait to see how this starts to infiltrate the UK, is that physical stores are starting to change in, tone, in terms of the role that they play. So previously, physical stores were all about encouraging shoppers to buy more items when they were in store. But actually, we're seeing the Walmart convenience stores in Tokyo, where the bottom half of the store is a convenience store, and the top half has been converted into a dark store from which they can fulfill online orders, whether that be packing those orders into an Uber or giving them to shoppers downstairs. We've got Dotcoza centers in South Africa, where actually excess space is being blocked off and is being used as extra warehousing. And in the UK, uh, we're seeing more and more retailers looking to 
increase the convenience of their in-store environment. So we got into, uh, as does Manchester Eastland store uh, last week, and this store is 13 years old. For quite a long time, it's been, it's been performing behind Asda's benchmark. But they've invested a huge amount of money in kind of really bringing it up to scratch and catering to different shopper needs and whatever is convenient to an individual shopper. Whether that be their expansive express diner at the front of the store, you see sandwiches and, sandwiches and drinks there, lots of different concessions all being built in there. This store is actually opposite Manchester City's Etihad Stadium, so a really perfect test bed for, for trialling the kind of high footfall generating concepts. But also in the same store, you've got attempts to make uh, this kind of concept of everything under one roof as compelling as possible. So this is a store where Decathlon have now been given 18,000 square feet. And having seen it for myself, it feels like a great fit. So we know already that George is a really compelling point of difference for us, the shoppers. What Decathlon does is it expands that apparel offer into sport. Uh, and it also does it in a really credible way for Asda's kind of heartland shoppers. So Decathlon sell a lot of activities-based uh, products. Um, so not necessarily specialist goods, but actually products and uh, activity sets that are kind of friendly for the whole family. So the Asda store then becomes um, a kind of a catch-all location for parents looking to sort out their family needs. Um, and again, look, shameless plug, but at the Asda Trade Briefing, as Nick mentioned, Roger Burney will be on stage talking about all of this, and ultimately he is uh, he's leading a lot of this work. Um, and then we're seeing retailers creating destinations out of their stores, whether that be uh, Morrison's installing these party zones. So what we are seeing in stores, and Asda Eastlands is a good example of this, is more space being given over to events, uh, higher and more events being in, in store at any given time to uh, maximise interest. What Morrison's have done is really interesting in terms of this fully full-time dedicated space to party. On the right-hand side, we've got Waitrose. So, one of the one of the things that we see from shoppers uh, is shoppers increasingly telling us that when they've got more disposable income, they will put that disposable income towards holidays or to eating out, saving money. Actually, spending on grocery comes quite far down the list. So, what Waitrose are doing through a bigger focus on hospitality. The example here being wine bars is actually looking to create a new pie uh, and looking to expand their, their kind of offer into areas where shoppers are showing them that they are willing to spend a little bit extra. But it's also about facilitating the ease of shop at the shelf edge. So we're starting to see more and more meal solutions coming into store that are really compelling, whether that be Waitrose, Waitrose's dinner for tonight bags that are kind of integrated into the counters or you've got Tesco trialing recipe boxes. And again, in Asda, just the last week, we started to see uh, previously up until now, they've been merchandising different types of burgers together. Well, they're now doing that around uh, meal solutions. So this is an example of roast dinner. So you've got all your different joints in one location alongside chilled Yorkshire puddings and gravy. They're also starting to merchandise bottles of Coca-Cola alongside their pizza. And the other element that's really important over the year ahead is going to be personalization. And the importance of this kind of can't be uh, under stressed. Uh, shoppers are telling us that supermarkets are becoming more and more interchangeable, and as a result, they're less tied to a single store than previously. And to a degree, that's kind of unavoidable, because we know that um, many, many shoppers decide where they're going to shop based on geography. So retailers have to appeal to a broad base of shoppers. But it's more and more important to build that distinction. As price becomes a ticket to play and more and more retailers engage in range rationalization, we're seeing retailers look to focus more on perimeter categories and uh, those areas where they can bring in more customer service and engage with shoppers and tell their own brand story in a more compelling way. A great example of that is what Asda are doing McGee's. So McGee's is a concession, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland sorry, concession that's come over. And you can see the staff are on the, on the uh, customer side of the, t of the counter engaging with people. Great example from abroad, Albert Hein in the Netherlands have pushed their cheese counters up against the wall so staff have to come round and speak to customers as they're restocking shelves. 
and all of that is being enabled by technology. So we're seeing in the States Walmart bringing through new technology uh, in their um, tills to speed up the process, and it means that you don't necessarily need to have staff on a till. Waitrose with their quick checkout where you can uh, generate a barcode for you so shoppers don't need to queue up or the Lobot which is running in Canada where uh, customers can go up and ask repeatable easy questions to these devices. All of these things are enabling the workforce to be deployed in different ways in different parts of the store. But technology is also enabling personalization in terms of really interacting with customers in Carrefour in France and Walmart in the States. We're seeing um, apps that actually customers can log into and it loads up their personal purchase data and their loyalty data and it makes personalized recommendations to them, gives them personalized uh, discounts based on their previous purchasing history. And that idea of personalization is increasingly going to come into e-commerce. So one of e-commerce's biggest challenges, is, as depicted on the left-hand side here, is that consumers tend to come online and they will shop as per their favorites or their previous orders, or they, they'll use search functionality. So for retailers and suppliers alike, the challenge is how you can start to disrupt that journey and put new products in front of them, encourage impulse purchase. Now what we're heading towards is something that Ocado are really championing, which is where the, your, the online environment starts to reflect your, you, you as an individual. So you log in and actually your previous purchase behavior starts to define what's put in front of you and what you see. For those of you who want to see an example of this in progress, uh, if you visit the Loblaw website, um, really nice example of actually at the beginning of your journey through the website, you self-select who you are and what your mission is. Slightly clunky perhaps, but a really interesting view into uh, the direction in which we're heading. In terms of Ocado, Ocado speak about this very passionately and what they want to do is bring back the feel of going into a specialized retailer where you get over-the-counter service, but actually recreate that online. So just to close, um, I think the points that we'd like to recap on is first and foremost, as we've shown, Brexit is going to add a huge amount of complexity to an already volatile market and clearly our own forecasts represent that and you'll have noticed that um, the, the kind of the scope and the range that we have from our low and high forecasts has increased dramatically but as we progress through the year we'll, we'll start to be able to narrow that down. Um, we'll see that cost pressures will make price investments significantly more challenging for both suppliers and retailers and demand creation activity is going to be key so there will still be opportunities to encourage people to trade up whilst the net effect might be negative one of the defining behaviors of the recession of the past eight to ten years has been consumers willing to trade down in certain areas in order to trade up and treat themselves in others um, we'll see that online and discount channels will lead to growth albeit both of them we have paired back their growth uh, versus previous iterations and really crucial to the years ahead will be this idea of catering to shoppers changing habits to build loyalty. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Nick who can give us a, just a quick plug on uh, some really interesting events that we've got coming up and then we'll get into the Q&A. Um, just to mention yes that we've got some masterclasses coming up um, very soon hosted by uh, my colleagues um, James Walton, our Chief Economist, and also Tim Bilson, who leads our convenience research. And they'll be looking at um, what the shape of the grocery market will be in future, sort of five to ten years' time. So these are free masterclasses are located in offices around the country. Um, we'll be looking at um, what you need to do to be prepared for the future, how shoppers are changing, and the expected impact of emerging technologies, and what stores need to do to attract shoppers in the years ahead. Um, so yes, six dates there around the country and do sign up for that. We'd be delighted to see you there. Um, and that really takes us through two questions. Um, so um, we've had a number of questions coming while we've been talking and we had more submitted before the session. Um, so just taking some of these, um, we've got a question here about um, the disruption from the discounters. Um, and do we see there? Uh, growth rates falling as um, the opportunity for store openings lessens. Um, um, and I'd say um, what we're seeing here is yes, there's definitely um, less physical growth coming through um, um, and discounters in general are finding more competition um, from revived um, competitor set. Um, 
and the multiples all recognizing um, where they need to be on price to um, <coughs> compete more strongly against them. Um, at the same time, also, discounters are suffering a bit from capacity constraints in store. That's beginning to impact the shopper experience. Um, um, but they're also fighting back. We've got some exciting new look stores coming through, some big investment plans um, from the likes of Lidl with, I think, a one and a half billion pounds it's planning to invest over the next few years. Um, so um, I think in general what we're seeing is discounters closing the gap with supermarkets in terms of the shopper experience and the, the quality of their stores. Um, clearly there's, there's a big difference in, in the types of the, uh, the store experiences around the stores. If you go to a brand new st the discounter then you'll see very different experiences than some of the older stores. Um, but um, shoppers aren't really making that distinction between um, supermarkets and discounters anymore. They just see them as um, the places they go to to buy food. So, um, um, so yes, it's it's gonna be tougher, I think, for the discounters to maintain that rate of growth going forward. Um, um, but at the same time, they are still committed to um, substantial store opening plans, and there are plenty of areas around the country where they don't have stores at the moment where we'd expect them to be in a few years' time. Um, we've got another question here about um, buying behaviour. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so we had a question through around whether we expect any significant shifts in terms of consumer food buying behavior over the course of the year. Now, uh, it's a really good question. Um, I think, so shoppers are telling us, so about 70% of shoppers are saying to us at the moment they don't expect to change their buying habits. That being said, we have seen throughout the recession and the recovery from the recession that consumers fundamentally changed the way that they were buying products in order to respond to um, the financial situation and their own financial difficulty. What's been really interesting with that is the, the, the phasing of that and how that behavior has changed. So if we look back over time, back when inflation was quite high, around about 2009, 2010, we saw volume sales really start to drop off. And it wasn't until inflation turned to deflation quite consistently that we saw volume growth start to uh, reappear. So, I think in terms of consumer buying behavior, I think it's worth remembering that at the moment, um, the economy is in a, is in a pretty good spot. Um, and really consumer behind, buying behavior will depend on how hard and how fast that inflation returns. Uh, it's also worth remembering that you know, when, you, when, you, when we look at, and for those of you who subscribe to Shopper Vista, you'll have seen this, when we look at where consumers are putting and spending their disposable income, Increasingly, it's been going towards quite, quite high cost items such as holidays, travel, home improvements. And actually shoppers are telling us that over the next couple of years, as they're looking to be slightly more financially careful, it's quite likely that those are the areas that may well start to get cut first. I think that there will always be scope for encouraging consumers to trade up and spend a little bit extra for an indulgence or for a product that makes them feel good. And as mentioned previously, you know, one of the most interesting things that we saw throughout the recession is because consumers were able to access savings so easily and because of omnichannel shopping, it was easier than ever before to trade down in certain areas whilst trading up in others. Um, so that, that, that's kind of the key things I'd say to that. Um, we've also had a quick question through about um, the challenge of kind of following consumer trends when we're looking at the unknown of Brexit uh, rather than the fact, factual growth in the economy. So um, in terms of if anyone's looking for more factual things around how the economy's been performing, we can absolutely provide that. It's really a question of time that we struggle with today. I think the other key thing there is that as much as Brexit is an unknown, there are certain things that we can be quite certain of at the moment when we look at the way that consumer lives are, lives are evolving, whether that be from smaller household sizes or um, falling birth rates, aging society, uh, health becoming a much more important factor on the agenda and increased connectivity. You know, the financial situation is one element that, that kind of shapes how consumers spend their disposable income. But there are certain mega trends, of which I've quoted a few there, which kind of will remain and are really, really important in shaping overall consumer behavior, such as shopping little often and using different channels. Um, so I would focus on them quite quite closely. I think they're really important. And again, if anyone has any further questions about that, 
please do get in touch. We'd be more than happy to take you through it. Okay, we've got one more question, perhaps. Um, question here about um, um, cross-merchandising products together. Um, will retailers um, have to overcome the barriers to, to do this more effectively to improve the shopper experience? And um, I think we've already seen quite a lot of work in this direction already. Um, I'm thinking particularly of um, food to go and um, and stores like um, Sainsbury's Nine Elms, where they have revamped the whole um, on-the-go offer and uh, created a more uh, much more logical and uh, um, store layout, which encourages people to browse and um, enables more products to be brought into that. So increasingly, we see more investment in food service and and using uh, concessions on, in food service to anchor those food to go sections and provide um, provide more um, for, for different types of shoppers. So um, that's definitely something that we'll see more of um, right across the sector. Um, so guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. We're now out of time. Uh, I'm just looking at the screen now. There's still lots of people logged in. So thank you for attending today, for your participation, your questions throughout. Um, don't forget, we will be aim emailing a copy of the slides out and a recording to everyone who registered in a few, a few days' time. So. Uh, if there are questions that we haven't been able to answer today, uh, please do send them through to us again and we will get back to you. Uh, and we'll hope to um, see you again on the next IGD webinar. Thank you very much.